Let's share today with a call to worship. I'll be the leader, you can be the all. Joy comes to those who hope in God. Our God is a God of healing and help and hope. Our God will keep faith with all generations. I'd like you to stand with me. God means what he says. What he says goes. His powerful word is sharp as sharp as a surgeon's scalpel. Scalpel. <laughs> Cutting through everything, whether doubt or defense, laying us open to listen and obey. Nothing and no one is impervious and unable to be affected by God's word. We can't get away from it, no matter what.
part of the church, to be a part of a, a society that uh, allows us the freedom to choose to outwardly express our faith through song, through teaching, through gathering. And Lord, we just recognize how, how, how incredibly grateful we need to be uh, that we have these freedoms and people are coming coming to Canada from countries that just don't have it and hearing their stories. And, Lord, we just uh, help us not to take it for granted. Help us to be joyous, joyful in our um, daily experience so that people would see you in us. Lord, just help us to make a difference in all that we do and all the people that we're in contact with, that they would be drawn to you through the experience of talking to us. We thank you for the experience of being here together, together today, Lord, just for the, the words that we get to lift up. And may they have meaning to us Amen. I'm going to ask um, the congregation to sit down, and all the kids, you're going to come here. Come up here, because we have a little something for you before you head. Just, you know, you can just stand here and just look at me. That's fine. You don't have to look at them. Because God's, we're talking about God's promises today. We're talking about God's promises. And um, I want to know, did you know that God promises to always love you? Did you know that? Yeah, and then he he also promises that, that his love cannot be taken away from you. You know that too, right? And um, but we also have a responsibility to him, and this is to always uh, try to follow his ways and allow him to guide us. He also commands us to love him and also to love others. So those are some things that he requires of us. Before you go to Julia upstairs today, and I know she's got some great things planned for you, um, I wanted to leave you with a verse from Proverbs. So in Proverbs, you just open up the middle of the Bible and it's kind of right there. Proverbs 8, 17. And God says, a promise to you, he says, I love those who love me, and those who seek me, find me. So it's, it's our prayer, it's our hope, that you will know God's love, and that you will always try to follow his ways, and that you will look for God in all the little things, in all the big things in your life, and that you will help, you will, you will let him help you and guide you. So you're gonna go off to Kids Quest, but there's, you know, there's some things you're gonna remember, that God loves you when you seek him, you will find it. Those who seek me will find me. And that you need to love God and you need to love others. Those are three things that you've learned even before going up to Kids Fest. So head on upstairs and the rest of us are going to stand and we're going to sing some more.
I invite you to uh, take your Bibles, God's Book of Promises, and turn it to Hebrews chapter 6. It's page 848, if that helps. Hebrews chapter 6. I'm going to begin reading at verse 13. The title there is The Certainty of God's Promise. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. Men swear by someone greater than themselves. And the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what he was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Good morning. Uh, good to see you this morning. I feel, I must say, this one, Mike, I feel a little bit like Brian Adams, so I might just break into some... I need somebody. Somebody. Okay, sorry. Um, let's move back a bit. So there's this um, guy named Doug Hammond. Some of you know, some of you are related to him. Uh, he has this interesting little talent where he has this poem by Robert Frost, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. He has it memorized. And not only does he have it memorized, he can rhyme it off really fast. So whenever we were at camp with him, I'd always try to find some kind of context where we're in a public forum to get him to recite it. And I would say, you know, we're going into the woods for campfire. Doug, I think there's a poem about the woods, isn't there? And he, and he would go into his really fast. The, whose woods these are, I think I know, and he would keep going. So I'm just going to read this poem for you. Uh, anyone who studied this in high school or university? Show of hands. I did. I didn't have it memorized. Um, whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must, must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near, between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest, e darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake, the only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep, but I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. Now there are many different interpretations of this poem. Uh, Robert Frost himself said, it can mean whatever you want it to mean. That's not helpful whenever writers say that. It's a pain. Um, some people think it's a poem about death. I don't know what poem they're reading, but I don't see death in there. Um, certainly it's a poem about nature. Um, one of the most um, common interpretations of this poem is that it's about the conflict between nature <coughs> The, stopping to enjoy the beauty of nature and having fulfillments to fulfill, promises to make. And so if you look at the poem, there are a number of words there that de de describe the nature part of it. Um, woods filling up with snow, a horse, farmhouse, frozen lake. I mean, if, if it's the middle of December or Christmas Eve, that sounds lovely. Right now it doesn't, but there is a context where it sounds lovely. Um, uh, Harness bells of a horse, you think it's sleigh ride, and, you know, everybody wants to go on a sleigh ride. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep. Contrast that with um, the, the, the overtones of expectations. Um, his house is in the village. Uh, he will not see me stand, stopping here. It's almost like I shouldn't be here, a bit of a guilty feeling. Um, the writer anthropomorphizes the horse, uh, puts his human characteristics on the horse. He must think it's strange that I'm stopping. He's giving his harness belt a shake, like, let's get moving. We shouldn't be here. Um, and then at the end, um, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. 
And really, this poem describes the human condition, doesn't it? We want to stop and enjoy life, but we always feel like we have fulfillments and promises to keep. Well, we all, we all know what promises are. There, there are many um, promises out there. There's celebrities make broken promises. Parents make broken promises. Broken promises. We, we break our promises all the time. Um, marriages is broken promises. Businesses is broken promises. Really, what is a promise? A promise is a hope of a better future. And which one of us would not want a better future? And it's really a hope of a um, better future. And the Bible has thousands of promises in it. Thousands of promises. In fact, one person did a count and came up with a figure of 3,573 promises in the Bible. Now that's probably not entirely accurate because some of the verses are implied promises. They are not direct promises, but they're implied. You can, you know, in a lot of verses there's double meanings to two things. But the, the word promise itself in the King James Version occurs 50 times. And uh, we just know that there are thousands of promises in the Bible. Now there are many categories of promises in the Bible. Um, here are some of the categories. Um, now some, some of these we have to be careful. Because when we talk about God making a promise, we have our own interpretations of God's promises. God has a promise. He keeps his promises, but we often inject our own interpretation into what that means. So some of them are cut and dry. I mean, eternal life, uh, 1 John 2.25 says, and this is the promise, uh, that he has promised us eternal life. No question about it. God's promises, he's not going to renege on this at all. In fact, he won't renege on any promises, but often, as I said, our own interpretation. Forgiveness. 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive, forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He promises us the Holy Spirit. In Luke 11, 13, we learn, if you then, being evil, know how to give, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? If you ask God for the Holy Spirit in your life, He will give it to you. Uh, so money and finances. Now this is one of those ones which requires a bit of interpretation. Um, Malachi 3.10, one of the most common uh, verses quoted. Try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of, your, of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be enough room for you to store it. Now, this one is, again, if you are asking God to get rich, if you're asking God for an Lamborghini, if you're not asking God for these things, and you, well, God promised, you might have difficulties with that. I personally can tell you I've had uh, this verse has come true for me in numerous times in the last number of years. Uh, I can give you a quick story. Um, years ago, I was looking at doing a writing course, and I wanted to get into writing some, some plays and other things and some children's stories, and the cost for that course was $600 US. And I wasn't sure, I mean, we just had a young family, we just, had, just our kids were young, and we just had a house, bought a house, and I I don't know if I want to plop down 600 US on this course. And so I prayed about it. And I said, God, I really feel you leading me in this direction. So I want to be good at this. So I'm going to go for it. And so I paid for that course. The day the visa bill arrived, I had already published a couple of plays in the States. Uh, publisher in the States uh, picked up a couple of my plays. And I got same day my visa bill arrived, my payment for the plays came. I got paid $300 each for two plays, 600 US. So that was exactly a, a promise there that was fulfilled for me. Uh, more recently, um, we had just moved into our new house seven and a half, eight, seven, seven years ago. Um, we, John Carson took us into this house the first day it was on, on the market. We weren't really looking in our area. We didn't think we, the house was a little pricey. And um, we went in, and the price seemed reasonable. And we were like, sure, let's take it. And by the end of the week, there were eight offers on the house. And in the end, ours was not the highest offer. And having just come through a difficult situation, I was completely trusting God. And I was like, God, if this house is meant for us, we will get it. If not, you've got something else planned for us. And I sincerely prayed that in all humility. And we got the house, and it was just amazing. So I've seen incidents like this. 
Like I said, it depends on your interpretation of, of, of that. Um, our needs, for sure. Philippians 4, 19, and my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. Um, if you're saying to God, there's this job I've applied for, you promised to look after my needs, so I want this job, you're going to give me the job, and you don't get the job. That's not God not supplying your needs. Maybe he has another job for you. So as I said, there's some interpretation uh, required. But we have other categories of promises in the Bible. We have biblical promises of healing. And as I said, interpretation. There, there are different types of healing. There's spiritual healing. There's healing from ailments. There's healing from life-saving diseases. And as you know, we can't all live forever. People do die. So when people die and they are healed, that's not God not fulfilling his promises. Um, and in fact, you know, I was, watch, I was uh, watching a sermon by James McDonald this week, and he talked about the book of Revelation. Did you know the book of Revelation has Beatitudes in it? Blessed are they who, and uh, the first one is, blessed are they who read this book. The next one is, uh, blessed are the dead, for they, what? Blessed are the dead? What? Uh, they will rest from their labor. So God's actually blessing us when we die. It's really kind of strange. Uh, I mean, I think that's why the, the Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot about heaven, is because if we knew everything we needed to know about heaven, we'd all be taking a short exit to get there. So, um, not everybody is healed from life-saving diseases. Um, and, and, but God, I do know situations where people have died, and I've seen God's promises fulfilled in their life, uh, with their spiritual life, with restoration of relationships. And even after they've died, I've seen healing and uh, blessings upon their families. And you can probably think of people you know like that, where uh, God's just come in and blessed the family uh, through that. Uh, there's promises about children, family, marriage, peace, overcoming temptation, protection, fear, resurrection, you will live again, um, end of suffering. There are many promises we don't really have the time to get into. As I said, there's over 3,000 by that one person's estimate. Now, the promises in the Bible aren't to be confused so much with the Proverbs. Some Proverbs are promises much like the promise which Lori just read to the children. It's a promise. Some Proverbs are more like wise sayings, um, which are generally true. They're like guidelines, okay? They're like the guidelines. Um, so, for example, Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That is generally true. I've seen that so many times in people who've grown up in the church, grown up in Christian homes, they've gone on and they've stayed there. I've also seen some really bad behaved pastor children. Uh, I was one of them, so uh, I can attest to that. But in general, that is true, the Proverbs are, in general are true and they are good guidelines for living. Well, the question is, are God's promises true? If I threw that out and asked for a show of hands, everybody would put up their hand because it's easy to put up your hand and say, yes, God's promises are true. And um, I think you're all here. Because many, most, maybe all believe that. Um, when you look at promises in general, um, promises get broken all the time. Forbes magazine actually came out with an article about promises. And, and it was really about strategies for getting people to keep their promises. So here's some strategies you can use to get what you want from people and get them to keep their promises. The first is decide what you want up front. So know exactly what you want, how much you want. Be specific, be specific in clarifying your expectations. This really is what I want. You're, you're focusing on this, and this is really what I want. Thirdly, ask for what you do want, not what you don't want. Then seek an explanation before making an accusation. So why would you say that? I need to know what you were thinking. Fifthly, share the impact of them not keeping their word. And uh, I know as teachers, Lori and I, and Lori, and other people, like, if you're in a responsibility position over people, you often have to point out, now, if you don't do this, this could happen, because we've seen it before. Uh, we've seen it before a lot of times. Um, sixthly, sh uh, reset and clarify your expectations. So just so we're clear, this is what I'm expecting. And seventhly, seventh, Reward the positive and correct the negative. I like what you've done here, but just 
what you, you, you're doing over here, I need you to fix that. So these are strategies to get people to keep their promises. With people, promises are iffy. Would you agree? With people, promises are iffy. Even people you trust sometimes, promises can be iffy. Not everybody keeps their promises. What about God? Is God iffy on his promises for you? It's easy to say his promises are true, but when we go through difficult times, it's not so easy. I recently read an article from a, a parent, a dad who is a Christian, a pastor. His three-year-old son had died. And he had to ask that question, is God good all the time? And he struggled with that for a long time. And it wasn't until months, maybe even a couple years later, when he was working with... Um, children and orphans where he started to get healing from losing his son and he, he gained a, a whole new meaning and ministry out of it and he was able to come through and experience healing in that. So there are things that come along our way, we all know. Um, there are people who go through difficult times and the whole time, Christians who go through difficult times, God is good, God is good, but when something bad happens, the questions are, where is God? Why would God allow this? I don't get it. And then when things turn out for the good, they're like, yeah, God is good all the time. And really it's like, um, for those of you who went through the Daring Faith series with Rick Warren, that is called what, does anyone remember what we call that, thanking God after? That's called gratitude. That's not faith, that's gratitude. And uh, un unfortunately, a lot of times as Christians, we show gratitude, not faith, when it comes to God's promises. So really, God is wanting to be in relationship with us, and he's asking us to enter into relationship with him. And we enter into his, a relationship with him by loving him and keeping his commands. And that's really the keys to a healthy relationship. If we were to look through the whole Bible, we could find God delivering on his promises so much. We could go back to the very beginning, back to Adam and Eve. God provided for Adam and Eve um, from the very beginning. If you look at, if everybody looks at Genesis chapter 1, open your Bible to Genesis chapter 1, and I don't need to tell you that's the first book in the Bible. If you take a look at what God, the promises God made here, the things God provided, in verse 26, he made um, man in his own image. God said, I've made you, and you're kind of like me. How awesome is that? All right? And then in verse 26 again, he says, And you can rule over creation, over all the fish, the birds, the animals, over all the livestock creatures. You can rule. It's like a big playground, basically. Imagine going to Disney World, and you showed up, and people at the gate said, Come on in. Guess what? You're the only people here today, and you get to do whatever you want here at Disney World. All right, it's, it's his own, it's like they were given their own playground. Verse 28, he told them the, to be fruitful, increase in number. So, you don't have to be alone. You can have the joy of being parents and grandparents and uh, give you more meaning in life. Verse 29, he says, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth. Every fruit, every seed, the food will be yours. Free food, no work. Pretty good. So God created this lush garden paradise, and he saw, in verse 31, we see God saw that it was good. So God entered into a relationship with man right at the beginning. He provided and he promised, you got all this. We'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. It's all free. It's, it's there, guaranteed. And um, he entered into a covenant with Adam and Eve. And pretty much God's promise, the Bible essentially is one continual covenant with us. It's a continual covenant and it started in Genesis. So when, when we see this, what is Adam and Eve's part of the covenant? If you look at Genesis chapter 2 verses 15 to 17 here is Adam and Eve's um, end of the covenant. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and take care of it. And the Lord commanded the man, you are, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden but you must not eat from the tree knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat it from it, you will certainly die. 
God did all this for them. They had one thing. You had one thing. You've heard that before, right? It's like God saying, you had one thing to not do, and they did it. So Adam and Eve broke the first covenant. So God, what did he do? He could have walked away and said, forget it. This human thing's not working out. Let's go over to this planet over here or whatever. Um, but God made a new covenant. Genesis chapter 3. <laughs> And uh, he made a new covenant after the flood. God comes into uh, Noah and he makes this uh, new covenant. Oh, sorry, I'm just skipping. So sorry, I'm going back to chapter 3 with uh, Adam and Eve. He makes this new covenant um, and he says basically, I have good news and bad news. What do you want first? Noah probably said the good news and he said, the good news is you can still live. And I'm like, oh, okay, good. I can live. Excellent. Okay, now for the bad news. Uh, come on over here, I'll tell you the bad news. Watch out for that snake over there. And then he curses the serpent. And then he says, to you, you're going to have a lot of pain in childbirth. And um, by the way, all this free food you got, it's no longer free. The ground is not going to grow on its own. You're going to have to work it. So you're going to have to work really hard. Before it was all no effort now, you're going to have to work by the sweat of your brow. And then one last thing, you're going to die. Okay, you're going to return to dust, and you're eventually going to die. So, that ended the first covenant. So, now there's a new covenant God is giving. Um, so, when we get to uh, Noah, time of Noah, after the flood, God sees shortly after this, man didn't learn their, their lesson, and we have the flood. And man is sinful, and women, by the way. Um, and then there's a flood. But... God makes a covenant with Noah. And he says, he says this. Genesis chapter 9. In verse 1 he says, God bless Noah and his son, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. The fear and dread of you will fall on the beasts of the earth and on the birds of the sky and on every creature that moves along the ground. And all the fish are given to your hands. Everything that moves will be food for you. Does that sound familiar? That's what he gave to Adam and Eve. It's a redo. It's a, another covenant. And what makes a covenant is also the other side of it. What is required. The only thing God's saying here is, he says in verse 4, you must not eat meat that has its life blood in it. And also further down, I will demand accounting for the life of another human being. So once again, there's this new covenant. And God seals the covenant with a sign in verse 12. This sign, the, this will be a sign that I will not, the rainbow, I will not, never, ever, I will never, sorry, too many double negatives. I will never flood the earth again. God could have written humankind off, but he's got a new covenant. Another promise. What happens two chapters later, though, is we have the Tower of Babel. And God sees these people trying to build this tower only two chapters later to reach heaven and be really being full of themselves. And uh, so that doesn't go over well. Then if we fast forward to Abraham, in Genesis chapter 17, God makes a promise to Abraham. And, he's, and Abraham is 99 at the time. And he said to Abraham, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. You and your descendants. And by this time, Abraham and his wife Sarah, no kids. So, 99. Crazy promise. I don't know if you've ever had a promise from God and you thought it was just unbelievable. Well, there's an unbelievable promise. And um, in verse 9 of that chapter, he says, But as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants, after you. Imagine God said to you, I'm going to bless you and your kids and your grandkids and your great-grandkids because you have obeyed me and you've kept my promises. I will bless you. And then you go on to Ancestry.com like 500 years from now. They trace it all back to you because you were faithful in keeping your commands with God and his promise. That would be awesome. Well, did God keep his promise? In Genesis 21, verse 1, we find out Sarah gives birth to Isaac. We're told in that verse 
The Lord kept his promise. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham at the very time God had promised him. He didn't just keep his promise. He kept it to the letter at the very time. Exactly. There was no gray area. There was no room for interpretation. He kept his promise. So all this has happened, and it's only been the book of Genesis. God's main promises, he's kept them every time exactly. People have been unfaithful and broken the promises, and he's had to reset and make new promises. If we go into the rest of the Old Testament history, the rest of the Old Testament basically is history of God's people getting promises to them and them breaking their part of the covenant. Um, they're wandering through the wilderness. They're complaining. They're thanking God. They're complaining. Then they're thanking God. Then they're complaining again. Kings rose up. Um, there were prophets coming along talking about Israel's imminent doom because of their unfaithfulness to God. Um, in year 70, 22 BC, the northern tribe of Israel was attacked from the Assyrians who came down through northern Mesopotamia, which is now Iraq. Turns out George Bush wasn't the first person to invade Iraq. They came in, the Assyrians came in, and took the, the kingdom of Israel. It was conquered. Then in 586 BC, the, uh, the Babylonians, who were the, the new people on the block, came in and took the uh, southern tribe of, tribe of Judah, took them, the temple was destroyed, took them in captivity. Then prophets came along and talked about a, a new hope awakening. So they beat George Bush to that title. So a new hope. Through the rest of the Old Testament, it's all, it's just, it's continual. God promises, they break it. God promises, they break it. Also in the Old Testament is foretelling of another promise of God, Jesus. You could go through the Old Testament, you could take an entire course just on the Christology of Jesus in the Bible, in the Old Testament. So there's many references to Jesus and Jesus is coming in the Old Testament, and it's really awesome that we can break that down. And Jesus came as a way of being a new Adam. He's referred to as the new Adam. A new, uh, a new covenant has started. And what do we need to do to receive this promise from God? All we have to do is accept this promise of eternal, eternal life. Um, John 14, 14. Jesus, uh, Jesus said, you may ask anything in my name, and I will do it. What does God require of us? John 14, 15 says, if you love me, keep my commands. So when you accept Jesus, you accept this promise. You can ask God of anything. He will do it for you. But you must keep his commands. Another co- a covenant with God. He's demonstrated over and over his faithfulness. And um, yet, sometimes we still have difficulty believing his promises are true. So what is our response? If God's promises are true, why do we have difficulty believing them? (coughs) As I said earlier, difficulties arise. We get bounced around. We try to blame. We give up. And I believe there's a lot of um, unclaimed promises, unclaimed promises out there whether they're um, marital, marital, children, job, financial. There's a lot of unclaimed promises out there because we, we, we just do not hold to believing them. When looking at unfulfilled promises, we shouldn't really look at the why. We shouldn't look at the how. We shouldn't look at the when. We should look at the who. And I don't mean the, the man. Our sin gets in the way of unfulfilled promises. God's demonstrated his love to us over and over. And even when we deny him and go against his promises, he gives us extra chances. So there's a song that um, kind of describes this relationship. Go ahead and play it. I don't know if you can hear it. Okay, so, are we 
we have sound troubles this morning, we do good on it. And if we had that on the live speaker, make sure people were up dancing and all that. Um, so now you can go home and tell people we had Lady Gaga in church today. <laughs> That's essentially our relationship with God. It's a bad romance when when we are constantly disobeying him and he's giving us, offering us promises, we get into a bad romance. And that's, that's what, sadly, the state that many of us are in. Well, there's two over, if you look at all the promises in the Bible, there's two overall generic, over umbrella type messages that we get from all the promises in the Bible. The first one is, uh, and it comes in different forms, it comes in different wordings, but basically it says, blessed is the person who trusts in the Lord. You see that in the Psalms over and over, you see it all through the Bible. Over and over, you will be blessed if you trust the Lord. The second one is, God is with us. Be bold, for the Lord thy God is with you. I will go with you, says the Lord. Emmanuel, God is with us. You see this all throughout Scripture. God is with us. Yet a lot of times when we pray, we often ask God to be with us. And it's kind of a funny thing because we know God is with us. And really maybe we need to be asking God to remind us that He is with us. Um, when we go through difficult times, we feel alone that God is not with us. Yet, that's one of the promises over and over in Scripture. So two things. Um, you, you will be blessed if you trust in the Lord. And God is with us. So, if we go back to the scripture reading that Valerie read earlier, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13. This is the ultimate passage on um, God's authority and on his promise keeping. Hebrews verse, uh, 6, verse 13. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself. Um, you've heard people swear promises. You know, I'll swear on a stack of Bibles if it helps. Because they're trying to get you to believe what they're saying is true. Um, I'll swear on my mother's grave. Cross my heart, hope to die. Poke a needle in my eye. I don't know if you young people know that one. We were a Bible generation. So. Um, I, okay, here's one for you. I swear by the moon and the stars in the sky. No, that one? No, okay. Um, I need somebody. I'll go back to my Brian Adams. In court, they used to have you swear in a Bible. They do probably do it in some little towns in the U.S. Generally now they don't. You have you, they have to make an affirmation. Some courts have the Quran. They have other faith book, faith books, um, just in case. Um, but generally, uh, you don't swear in the Bible. I worked in the, the Vancouver courts when I was a teenager, uh, summer job for the Salvation Army. And they, they swear on the Bible, right, right, right hand, and swear on the Bible. Uh, Christians often make affirmations because the Bible says, like, you're gay, gay, you're gay, gay, gay. And you really shouldn't have, if you're a trustworthy person, you really shouldn't have to swear. Uh, so, anyway, they don't usually use the swearing in the court, swearing on the Bible in the court. But here, God, it's like God saying, okay, I'm going to make a promise, I'm going to swear on it by, oh, I'll swear on myself, because I'm supreme. So that's the first thing we need to know, is um, God is supreme. God is supreme. The second thing from this passage we get is in verse 18. God did, th did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. So we can work on a simple equation based on this passage. There's no one greater than God. God doesn't lie. So if God's telling us over and over and over in his word that um, these promises are true, that things will work out for you if you trust him, then we can, this equals things will work out for you. Okay, if God is supreme, he doesn't lie, and he's telling me things will work out for me if I trust him, then things are going to work out for you if you trust him. Okay? We don't need to be tossed around and every time we go through a trial, back and forth, this is not really the life a Christian should be living. We should be, I think one of the reasons we go through trials as Christians is to display the superiority of the life lived in Christ. Not that we are superior, we are not. 
but we have a superior God. And if we can um, live that life to others, showing that even when trials come along, we are, we are, there's something about us that makes us an even keel. And one of the greatest compliments you can get by somebody, maybe if people, non-Christians in work or school or anybody you know, one of the greatest compliments you can get from them is, you're kind of an even keel person. You, what is it about you? That, like, how is that? And uh, I remember one time I was um, on a lake at a place called Madawaska, uh, a property that the Army, Salvation Army used to own. Don't ask. Um, we were in the middle of the lake in a sailboat. I was with a friend named Grant Wells. And Grant Wells was from New Zealand, and he used to know how to sail. He knew how to sail. So we were in this, like, eight-foot sailboat, and we're in the middle of the lake, and there was this little rope that he had attached to the sail. It was only a little eight-footer, and he'd sail, you know, you know what he's doing, and I was just taking it and enjoying it, sitting back enjoying it. And at one point, he got caught off his guard, and he had the rope on the floor of the boat. And a wind came along and grabbed the sail, and he just kind of, you know, casually just went for the rope, and it was gone. It went, kept going. And then the casual reach went for one of these, and the sail just took the full wind. And the next thing I knew, I'm up sideways like this, and I remember thinking, I just remember this at this very moment, we're going in, and the water, it's going to be flipped right over. Sure enough, we're flipped right over, and I'm like, oh my goodness. So we're in the middle of the lake, uh, no light jackets on, back in the day, um, and I can swim, I mean, I wasn't so much worried about that, but um, we're out there in the middle of this lake, and it's like, wow. So we eventually got the boat flipped over, somehow got it flipped over, full of water, we, the, the bailing bucket, we probably swam and grabbed it and, and bailed water and got it going and got back to shore safely. I think there's a lot of times when we get news, we get, we see things happen, we're like that, we're in the water like, what are we going to do? I'm stuck. And, and we kind of freak out and we stay in that state for a long time. Um, some of you are New, new year since the last seven and a half years. Uh, I won't get into a lot of detail, but I'll give you a quick rundown of our story. Um, but seven and a half years ago, just to get you up to speed, two out of three of our kids almost died. Okay, so you're up to speed. Yeah, cool. Okay, I'll go into more detail. Um, so we had Nisha, had a, she was diagnosed with uh, the flu, but it turned out to be a ruptured appendix. Uh, it was weeks before we got her to the hospital. Got we got her to the doctor a couple times and it was misdiagnosed. And we got her to the hospital, got her home and recovering, and then I got a phone call that uh, Kayla had melanoma, had cancer. And the phone call basically said she more than likely had five, less than five years to live. And even if she didn't survive this, it would always come back. Yeah, it, there's always a chance that it could come back. So this would be haunting us for the rest of our lives. And I mean, what do you do with that? Where's the hope in that? And of course, I freaked out. I mean, my reaction, I was, by the time I hung up the phone, I was literally on the floor crying like a baby. And so I, I called Valerie, she was on the 404 driving home, so I couldn't tell her. So I called Beth, Beth Piro, um, within less than, I'd say, eight minutes, Beth was at my house. And Dave Piro was like right behind. And then Catherine Rollins was there a few minutes later, and, Catherine went and picked up my, our kids from school. The other two kids were still at school, Kayla and Luke. And uh, it's like a, a day I'll never forget. Our world was turned upside down. Our boat was flipped. And for a while there, we were living in no hope. We were, we were grasping at anything. But really quickly, I humbled myself, for sure. I mean, God had my attention. I humbled myself. And I started looking in his word for answers. Well, I actually didn't start there. I started with the internet. I started with asking other people. The doctor's offices were closed for the weekend. The doctor was not in work on the Fridays. All these chain of events happened and we couldn't get a hold of people. We were, we were left to rely on the internet and just asking other people. And Eventually, um, we started going to scripture. And I'll tell you, I started seeing promises in scripture which kept coming back to me. And I said, I kept praying them off. God, I mean, this is what I've been given, the diagnosis that I've been given. If these scripture references are just my doing, 
take them away. Don't put them in front of me. And they kept coming back. And then I kept seeing signs of Kayla seeming better. She was not in pain like after her surgery. The doctor told her she had a lot of pain. She, she was not 24 hours after surgery. She was walking around, no pain at all. She went trick-or-treating for three hours, up and down stairs. And it was all these weird things. And I started thinking, maybe these promises are lying to me. And so I, I got to Psalm 91, and there's a verse that says, verse 18, um, Psalm 91, uh, because he, he loves me, says the Lord, I will deliver him in times of trouble. I will rescue him. And I started saying, God, as a sign, if, if this is what you're saying to me, that she's going to be fine, then show me Psalm 91 somewhere. And I started getting all these appearances of Psalm 91 within days. The next morning, the next morning I was at a music teacher's uh, conference at the airport. And a great 7 8 band from a public school, the first song they played, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, Psalm 91, verse 2. Following the next few days, that was Friday. On Sunday, went to church. Beth Carroll handed out a list of scripture verses. Psalm 91 was on there. That, that day, later on, we went to the ministry center to pray uh, for Kayla and her family and Mary Halbert. The first, ver- the first thing she said as she prayed was the first verse of Psalm 91. She, she quoted it. And then all these things happened. And, but then we went to the, the sick kids and got the results of the operation. Revealed that the cancer had spread to their lymph though. So then we had to have another operation. And, and so I'm questioning, well, if you're giving me these promises. Why, why are we getting this news? Um, and then they still kept coming. You saw my one, and I can give you more examples. But basically, um, the week before we go down to get the final results of this second operation, where we're going to find yes or no, is it too late? Is it contained? Um, I'm sitting at a stoplight thinking, am I reading too much into these appearances of Psalm 91, God? And then on the radio, the good news verse for the day, Psalm 91. And it's, um, it was basically the verse that I just quoted to you, um, because he loves me. And then I knew at that point, there's no one going back. I was like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go back and forth with this. I know. And um, I don't know if you've ever been snorkeling. Our kids and I have been snorkeling in Bermuda. And you try to get on the rocks, and it's like, you're going to get cut up really bad if it gets too crazy, a big road wave comes. So you either throw them up on the rocks, or you just kind of like jump away. Uh, Luke and I had this favorite snorkeling place in the Horseshoe Bay at the front, and we brought Kayla one time, and I had to throw her up on the rock because it was getting so crazy. God does not want you living like that, going back and forth on the rocks. And um, so anyway, the... The result, I'm just going to quickly go through the rest of that story. Um, so six months later, we're at music camp, and our daughter finds a little mark on her foot. She's a little concerned about I'm concerned, thinking, could it be cancer again? And I prayed that night, and I said, God, I think you went to rescue her six months ago and told me that you're going to rescue her, and then six months later, we're going to get cancer. So what is the warranty on this? Are you saying she's going to be good for life, or what is this? If that's the case, if she's not going to get cancer again, show me Psalm 91 somewhere. And that was Wednesday of music camp. And I didn't see Psalm 91 at camp. It just didn't happen. And I got home, we came to church Sunday morning, and Beth's sermon was on Psalm 91. The whole text was up on the screen. She went through verse by verse. And it was like, wow, I cannot believe this. I mean, I, I can believe it, but it was it was awesome. I went and told Beth, you don't know this, but your sermon here was, well, it's kind of because of me. No, it wasn't because of me, but it was an answer to prayer, and I explained that to her. Um, well, then three months later, we were going down to sick kids for a PET scan. Okay, and I had to go through a PET scan machine. They told us she'd be having these every six months indefinitely because they had to keep track. Because it was hard to find this type of cancer. So they would have to keep doing PET scans. So the, the night before, so I go to the PET scan, we take a day off work and a uh, day off school, and I watch her going in and out of this machine for like 45 minutes. <laughs> the next week, we're going down for the results. The night before, I, I pray, God, I kind of thought you had said she was done forever with cancer. Am I mistaken? So I prayed the promise from Psalm 91, and I said, if she, I, I want to know, is she ever, ever, going to get cancer again. And if not, then why are we doing these PET scans? 
So 12 hours later, I'm in the office. Um, the, the doctor, I call this, comes up and she says to Kayla, she says, now, we said you're going to do PET scans every six months. Uh, we decided we're going to go with ultrasounds for now, um, so we're not going to do any more PET scans. And I said, well, would you do one like every five years or whatever, just to keep on track of this? And she said, no, I don't think this is ever, I don't think this is ever going to come back again. And I knew then God had fulfilled his promise. He actually told me the future. I know it sounds crazy, but God's told me the future. I know Kayla's never going to have cancer again. He, he fulfilled that promise right then and there. The interesting thing is, two years later, we're going down to sick kids for routine treatment and to the oncologist for a checkup, and the oncologist says, you know what, Kayla, we don't need you to come anymore. We don't think you're ever getting this again. None of the kids, the sick kids with this, with melanoma have gotten again. It's like a freak thing. You're not getting cancer again. And really, it was them catching up to God from two years ago, what God had told me through his word. Well, the problem with um, promises is we, I think we often invite God into our lives when things go wrong. And we, we know God can has promises for us, for our betterment. The problem is, if you think of a doorway, um, we invite God into the doorway of our lives to come in and fulfill his promises. The problem is, we invite other gods into that doorway. And God's a bit of a gentleman. I think he says, oh, you're here too. Okay, you go, you go first and see how that turns out. And he steps aside. Um, First God that we sometimes got top three picks of gods that we allow into our lives alongside of the God that we want. First one is the God of worry. Uh, Matthew 25 says, do not worry about what to eat, drink, wear, but seek him first, and all these things will be added to you. And I don't think God's not, God's not saying, I mean, you, you shouldn't worry. If you, if you get a cancer diagnosis or if you get some kind of crazy event comes along you, along to you, you should not be, oh yes, no problem, God's got this. I mean, maybe you can be, but he knows we are human and we're not going to be at first. Uh, in Psalm 103, we, we read that God knows our frame. He knows we are dust. He knows basically we're pretty fickle. We're pretty, we're pretty uh, weak. So that's why he gives us thousands of promises. So we can remind ourselves of these promises over and over and then when these things come along, sure, we're going to freak out. And then we kind of assess the situation. And I think while we're freaking out, God's got his arm around us saying, I know, I know. Yeah, you're right, I know, this is tough. Then when we kind of gather ourselves from our initial emotional thoughts, we, we go, yeah, you know what, God's got this. I'm going to stop worrying about it. I'm going to stop trying to fix it. The second God that we invite alongside of God sometimes is um, the God of luck. So it's kind of like, God needs just a little bit of help. I'll have you here just in case God needs a little bit of help. Uh, when we went to sick kids, a lot of times the doctors would say, she will be fine, knock on wood. We heard that phrase over and over again, knock on wood. Um, I have a co-worker who came to me with a concern, and, and I said to her, oh, I'll pray for you about that. And she said, oh, good, because I'm, I'm asking other people on staff too, you know, people of other faiths too, faiths too. I just want to cover my bases, you know. Um, that is inviting the God of luck into your life when you do that. Um, financially, my life is a mess. I need to go and win the lottery. That's the only thing that's really going to make it better. I need to, it, it's like God needs help with your finances, so go win the lottery. By the way, you know what the biblical model for gaining wealth is? If you go back to Genesis with Adam and Eve, it's work. And in Proverbs 13, he says, uh, it says, wealth from get rich quick schemes quickly disappears. Wealth from hard work grows over time. And another verse, uh, there are many of these verses, but in Ephesians 4, 28, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their hands. Um, so there's a lot of us, we believe, yes, God has his promises for me. I trust God, but maybe subconsciously we have, we're trying to help God. So we bring in luck. 
There was a, a 1980s uh, music group. I'm a music teacher, so uh, music person, so I have to have music references. Uh, there was a 1980s band, and they were kind of like the rock alternative band of the day, sort of like Coldplay is now. They weren't as successful as Coldplay, but they were still. Does anyone remember Alan Parsons Project? Oh, okay, cool. Well, they had this one album called Turn Up a Friendly Car, and it was my favorite Alan Parsons album. In fact, the whole one side of the album, it was one track. It was 16 and a half minutes long, and it's called Turn Up a Friendly Car. And um, I'm going to play a little bit of the lyric. I don't know if we can pull up the mic. Does anyone remember that song? It was me. Okay, dude. Um, yeah, so this is a secular band in 1980, pretty much talking about the folly of luck. And I thought that was pretty, uh, pretty wise, uh, wise song. Well, um, so there's luck. We also invite another god, the god of time. When things go wrong, we want answers immediately. We want it fixed immediately. If we don't hear from God, we grasp at the things we can get immediately. As I said, the internet, there's where you can get your information about your diagnosis. Um, people, we sometimes make rash decisions based on what we can grasp immediately. Um, if you look at Hebrews, back to the passage in Hebrews, at verse 15, Hebrews 6, 15. When God fulfilled his promise, when God first gave his promise to Abraham, his wife Sarah, what was her response? Does anyone know what Sarah's response was? Valerie, yeah, she laughed. She laughed. Uh, what was Abraham's response in verse 15 here? After waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. When your promises are unfulfilled by God, do you laugh? Or do you wait patiently? And finally, that leads us to the last part of when your promises are fulfilled, what should you do? When your promises are finally fulfilled, you should remember. The Israelites, their whole history was all about remembering the Exodus and the key events of their history. Um, they recounted this the things that had, God had done, even in the, uh, when God gave the Ten Commandments to the Israelites in Exodus 20, he said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. He reminded them. They were constantly reminded through their culture. Moses was seen as the leader of the divine law, and not only in Exodus and Deuteronomy, uh, many books in the Bible, the Psalms, Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Daniel, Hosea, Jeremiah, and many more, they all re referred back to what God had done how he fulfilled his promises with the Exodus. Even in the New Testament, um, when they refer to the New Covenant, Jesus, they refer back to the, to the Old Covenant with, um, with Moses. So, when God has still fulfilled promises in your life, do you remember? If you, if you do, then you'll be the, the next thing, you'll be thankful. If you're thankful, you're going to have less in your life to complain about. And finally, you should be telling others about God's promises <laughs> in your life so that you can encourage others. Back in the, uh, when I grew up in the Salvation Army, we used to have this thing called a testimony period. And it would be on a Sunday night meeting. They'd have a Sunday night service, and in there would be a testimony period where they'd invite anybody who wants to get up and sing a song or two. Um, they'd get up and they'd say something about their life, what God's doing 
that week or some miraculous thing that's happening in their life or um, different things like that. And um, I remember one song we used to sing, I, I don't suggest we bring it back, it's kind of old and outdated, but one of them was, I want to tell you what the Lord can do, what the Lord can do for you. He lifted me from the mire clay, oh, what a happy day. I want to tell you what the Lord can do, what the Lord can do for you. He can save your life as he did mine, and he make it anew. And so they sing a verse, and then you get up, and the people stand. And I grew up in my teenage years in Newfoundland, and you have these Sunday night meetings, and they sing the songs over and again, and over and again. Caroline knows what I'm talking about. You sing the same chorus over and over, and then they get up and have a testimony period. And sometimes these testimony periods will go on for like a couple hours. And for, for me as a teenager, I'd be looking at my walk Sunday night, i got to get home, i got to go to school, I, I want to relax when I get home. I didn't really like that so much. And when the, when the pastor would get up and say, you know what, I'm going to discuss with the sermon tonight. We've had a great service. I would say, I said, yes. But you know what? Imagine that for two hours, people, one after another, can get up and just tell what God has done in their lives. Wouldn't it be amazing if we did more of that? Not necessarily here, but out in our everyday lives, if we can tell people, when opportunities come our way, if we can tell people what God has done for us, how he's been faithful to us, what a difference um, we can make. So if we're living in the grace of God, we should, should really be telling others. Well, I'm going to invite the worship band to come up here again. And I just want to ask you, think, think these questions for yourself. Where am I with God's promises? Are you like the speaker in the Frost poem who is kind of stuck in the middle of nowhere? In that poem, the Robert Frost poem, the speaker actually doesn't go anywhere. He doesn't arrive anywhere at a farmhouse. He knows he has promises to keep, but he doesn't actually leave. He is just there. Are you like the speaker in the poem who's stuck there, knowing there are promises to keep, but for whatever reason, God hasn't gotten around to fulfilling your promises, like God is stuck in the middle of the woods? Or maybe you are that, that person stuck out of nowhere because of promises unfulfilled. I want to tell you, God is wanting to fulfill promises in your life. Will you allow him to fulfill those promises by humbling yourself and waiting on him? We're going to sing a song together, Lord, I Need You. Um, and during that song, there will be an offering taken. And then afterwards, we're going to uh, sing the chorus a few times. And we're just going to be looking at some promises that are up on the, the screen. So um, if you want to stand with us, we're going to sing, Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you.
watch and read and listen. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. We're going to close today with soul on fire. Let's stand together and sing. Lord,